at a start. So I'd like you, I'd like to introduce Benny Hoverda. Uh, Benny is a uh, full professor since last December at the University of Louisville. He worked on his PhD thesis simultaneously at the Kaplan Institute of Independence and at the Space Telescope, where I met him. His thesis work was done under the supervision of Ron Allen and uh, Pete from the crowd. Uh, it was on the opacity of spiral disks. While at Space Telescope, he also contributed to uh, data reduction of the WIF PIC2 instrument. And the graduate students from the time will argue that one of his greatest contributions to astronomy during that period has been the user manual for sex tracking. <laughs> he followed this up with postdocs and research fellowship positions at Space Telescope, the University of Cape Town, STEC, and at Leiden University, and has been at Louisville since 2017. Today, he's going to tell us about measuring dust distributions using occulting galaxy pairs. So, Benny, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, everybody can hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Uh, yeah, so uh, you can uh, never outrun the topic of your PhD. This is still uh, um, what I did uh, 20 years ago, uh, overlapping galaxies and, uh, and how uh, transparent are galaxies. So this is what came out of eventually out of my PhD. If you want to contact me, there are my contact information here at the bottom. I am still on Twitter. Um, <clears throat> maybe terminally so, but um, have a, there we go. So um, <clears throat> the motivation has sort of stayed the same, except that we want to improve our accuracy. Why do are we interested in dust? We are interested in dust because it obfuscates the wavelength that we are interested in, right? We want to uh, understand star formation. We understand star formation by very blue wavelengths, by um, ultraviolet light, by H alpha. Uh, and that is affected by the scattering medium that we look through. So one of the issues is that um, <clears throat> that's one of the, i to admit somebody real quick. Uh, apparently it doesn't work. All right. Um, so the other one is that if you have a scattering medium and absorbing medium in between, the stuff looks further away than it is. Um, and so, um, can I get right? Yes, but they can button. Um, and so, there, but there's lots of other stuff that happens uh, with intergalactic dust in galaxies. So it's important for astrochemistry. The grains themselves are really interesting. Uh, it's a good measure medium to measure the turbulence in uh, disks. Uh, it messes with the distance indicators, uh, the role in SCDs, uh, so spectral energy distribution of galaxies, like the gas tracer, uh, the interface between interstellar medium and intergalactic medium. Uh, and of course, uh, we trace star formation through various things. So I think of dust as sort of like the absolute end all multi tool of astronomy. Uh, so if I, as long as I can observe, uh, as long as I can observe it. So there's two specific motivators that I sort of uh, hone in on here. It's the spectral energy distribution modeling of galaxies and supernova 1A distances, two things that are quite important uh, recently. These are just Two examples, uh, dust will play a role in your life unless you manage uh, to uh, to avoid it altogether, which uh, good luck. Um, so uh, the first one is uh, spectral energy distributions of a galaxy. This is one example, NGC 4244, uh, where the red points are essentially photo photometry measurements at a particular wavelength. Uh, and these are from 2011. And then suppose you uh, want to model that, you sort of model the uh, shortest wavelength as a combination of black bodies, which are you know, your stars. And then you've got uh, dust that's sort of the second black body around uh, 100 micron in wavelength. However, as soon as you start adding points to that, uh, so for example, you get new spire data because Herschel has just launched and this is exciting. Um, then, uh, and you get this uh, Herschel image that shows that the galaxy itself is actually uh, quite uh, blobby. Uh, I think is the technical term. Um, and so you realize that uh, you want to re redo the model. So you do a smooth model, and the smooth model looks like that in the image. Um, and it seems to fit the data points just fine. Um, but, all right, I'm, I can't admit, uh, here we go. Can I, can anybody see my, I don't, I can't see my, all right, I can't see my um, cursor. So, um, if you then want to go, I want to make my model image to appear just like the Herschel uh, submillimeter image looked like, I'll actually put everything in clumps instead of like a smooth dust distribution. And as soon as I do that, you get the dashed uh, model here, which means that all the clumps that 
really, really cold because they sell shielding. And so the temperature drops. And so you need to keep adding more of these clumps in order to actually get the emission that you're seeing. And so not only do you have to add a bunch of clumps in 10 times more dust mass, you also have to heat some of the clumps internally in order to, to make everything line up again. So um, the thing that I want you to take away from that is it's really important that dust isn't in a smooth disk in a galaxy. It's really important that it has dense clumps and a diffuse clumps and all kinds of densities in between. And that really changes the way that we look at the light coming off a galaxy at every wavelength. Because if we're trying to figure out how many stars there are and how many new young stars there are, uh, th those are especially bright and blue, if there's dust in, in front of it, we're sort of hiding them. Um, if we're trying to figure out what the millimeter data looks like, uh, it's important how the dust is distributed because if it's self-shielding, it, uh, it can get a lot colder, so you have to put sources inside. So you need it clumpy and heated. That's the only way that it actually matches up. The other reason that I'm doing this is because, well, uh, there's now currently controversy on the Hubble constant once again. Um, <clears throat> so if we want to measure the Hubble constant, we um, have the distance indicator from supernova and we have the redshift. And so the redshift distance uh, map is where we want to, um, to put the supernova on. However, if we're fitting a light curve, if we're trying to figure out how bright that supernova is, there is some host galaxy dust in front of it. Now, how much? That depends on how massive that galaxy is. More, bigger galaxies have more dust, but also where exactly in the, the host galaxy is our supernova. And so if you put the supernova close to the center, so sort of halfway out of the disk, then it f f follows that dash line. That's the assumed distribution of extinction values that we're seeing. But if I move it out a little bit, the odds of hitting a really high level of extinction go down. But if I fit as if that dash line is there, I'm actually putting that supernova slightly too far away. And if you look at the data points there, yeah, you see some of them scatter out. Uh, however, if I put it in a massive galaxy, the blue galaxy, uh, even if it's you know a little bit out, there are some, there's just a higher probability of hitting a certain amount of dust, a, a, a higher level of dust extinction. And so I actually might be underestimating the distance. Uh, and then putting it too close. And so the scatter is what probably uh, is, um, there's some scatter intrinsically from supernova, not every supernova type one is identical, but the amount of dust that's in front of it is another reason that we're seeing scatter around the Hubble law. And um, that's asymmetric. So preferably we'd have a distribution, a best bulk distribution, a special one for each type of host galaxy. So we say like, oh, this is a 10 to the nine galaxy. You're about halfway out of the disk. Here's your probability of hitting an amount of dust. Which comes to the motivation for this project. I wanna give a, a dust forecast. I wanna be able to say, what are the odds of getting a certain amount of extinction? And so we express extinction as A, which is the amount of magnitudes it's dimmed. Uh, in V, so that's the V band, uh, the vocalers, no, not the vocalers, uh, Johnson V band. Um, and what is the dependence on wavelengths? So if I go to longer and longer wavelengths, how much does that diminish? And so that's the probability distribution of AV values. So that's sort of the normalization and the probability distribution of RV values, which is the reddening law. And so how does, if I look at a random piece uh, in a galaxy of a certain type, so an SC galaxies of 10 to the 10 and a half uh, uh, solar mass, sorry, log 10, um, 10, 10 and a half solar mass is something like the Milky Way, and am I about halfway out? What are the probability of, her of getting a certain amount of extinction? And what and how does that depend? What's the, the reddening law there? And so that's sort of a forecast. And how do I do that? Well, through this little observational trick, we use overlapping galaxies, galaxies that happen to be along our line of sight. So really just, we get really lucky with uh, the geometry of the two galaxies and our, um, our line of sight towards them. And then we assume that galaxies, we just do one assumption, galaxies are rotationally symmetric. We assume that if I flip the galaxy around, it's pretty much a good description of the original galaxy image. So I say like, this galaxy is rotationally symmetric and this galaxy is rotationally symmetric. I take the light from both the foreground and the background, the gray arrow, that area in the, the overlap, and I say, okay, that 
should be the combination of both the background, the orange arrow, and the foreground galaxy, the blue arrow. And if I add those two together and both of the galaxies are completely transparent, the foreground galaxy is completely transparent, then that should be the same. However, if there's, if, so here's what I'm doing it, I'm putting it in math, it's the only math I can handle as an astronomer. Here's the uh, flux of the foreground galaxy, flux of the background galaxy, and then a little bit of extinction. So we use E2 to the power of minus tau, that's optical depth. We can also say, we can use the term uh, transmission. Um, and so we're assuming that both of them are symmetric, which means that I can construct this equivalence and solving for optical depth, I get a direct measurement of the optical depth in the overlap region assuming symmetry. So I could do this in a single color, in a single image. If I have a black and white uh, picture of a single filter of a galaxy, I can measure the optical depth in the overlap region in that filter. Okay, so of course, real galaxies are not very that well behaved. And in fact, they're really hard to spot finding these overlapping pairs. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it, we kind of went from a dearth of them um, so back when Bill Keel was doing this 20 years ago, he sort of had a short list that friends of him gave it like, oh, you like overlapping galaxies, here you go. Um, and so he used every kind of overlapping pair that he could get his hands on, but you get some really great HST pictures from that. Um, and this was another one of those examples of a 2009 paper that we did, uh, direct result of going to a meeting where Julianne Del Canton was like, oh, you like overlapping galaxies here. I found this one in my angst survey, here you go. And so this is a, a fun little project where we have a tiny little galaxy, this is a dwarf galaxy. You can see all the dusty structures around it. And in fact, on the on one side, it looks like it doesn't have those dusty structures. You simply can't see them because there isn't a bright distant galaxy backlighting and highlighting them. Otherwise we would never know that they were there. Um, you can see all these, like you can see what a train wreck some of these things are, um, because if they start interacting, which these two, these two are, um, that whole symmetry assumption kind of goes out the window and uh, we have to do something cleverer than that. But it's pretty neat that you have these, uh, these interactions sometimes just to look at. So what can you get out of this? We can get the line of sight and attenuation. So how much dust there is in the, in the foreground galaxy. And we can, if we have multiple wavelength data points, we can see how it changes with wavelength. So we can actually see what the reddening law is. So we can, these are the two things that we're trying to get in this overlap region. So you can get the probability from imaging, the higher resolution, the better. We can get the other one from either multi-wavelength imaging. So lots of different colors or an IFU integral field unit, so spectroscopy at every point in the, in the image. Now, we started off with very few of these, but you do get an impression that if you look at these overlap regions and you look at the Hubble pictures of those, you get extinction distributions that are very different. So there's already an in indication that if you look at a more massive galaxy, you get a bigger tail. If you are looking at a smaller galaxy, you just have the distributions. Everything is optically thin effectively. Um, and so you need to model your SEDs accordingly with stellar mass. You need to make sure that if you do supernova fits, this is the, uh, this is the information that goes into the fit. Not only that, if you go from, uh, so this is optical Z through U, and then the last two images, U and U, V, W1 and U, V, N2, those are ultraviolet. Um, and so the, uh, we can actually measure the dependence of AV on wavelength. And this is what Bill Keel did in 2014. It's really hard to get UV data, uh, mostly because we don't seem to have a good UV uh, space mission at the moment. A Hubble does UV, but barely. Um, <clears throat> and so the reason that you want to do this is I want to draw your attention to the curves. So we have wavelength on the x-axis and we have the amount of attenuation as a function of wavelength on the y-axis, uh, we normalize it by AV. Um, but um, you see the uh, green lines and you see the blue lines. Uh, the Witt and Gordon models are for the Milky Way. So those, those seem to have this big bump around 2000 angstrom. Um, other models like Calcetti's um, uh, star formation galaxies don't have that bump or the SMC, which is from uh, Vivian Wild, I think. That's the uh, SMC and LMC they don't have the bump at all. So it's a really unclear whether or not that weird bump is in the attenuation curve or not. So this is why we wanna get a, 
UV information as well. It's still a little bit out there whether or not other galaxies have that 3,100 angstrom bump, as it's called, uh, because we only have seen it in the Milky Way so far. So what's the hard part? Actually, the hard part is finding these things because they are the ultimate blended object. It's two galaxies on top of each other. So they really don't pop out of the source extractor catalog or um, uh, any other catalog, really. It's the kind of uh, thing where your typical catalog uh, just sort of puts a question mark. Um, and so it's really hard to, uh, to find them. And then it's also really important to, to, to figure out whether or not these are interacting galaxies, at which point all bets are off, especially the symmetry uh, assumption. Uh, and so this has really been the realm of the human eye uh, most of the time. Um, however, what I've been doing is sort of uh, going through people's crash. Oh, um, <clears throat> uh, so I've been looking at strong galaxy galaxy lensing surveys, uh, group catalogs. So if you want to find out which galaxies are in a group, so you have wretches for everything in the, that's close, close together and wretched surveys in general. Um, and so if you just have a wretched survey like the slow digital sky survey, gamma or uh, the devil survey, you look for something where you have a wretched solution for two different templates that are almost equally good. So you have something with emission lines and you have something with a passive, like an absorption feature. And the absorption feature is like a wretched one and I'm sorry, one redshift and the uh, one with the emission lines is a second redshift. And then you look for the ones that are disparate enough. And so I'm looking for an emission line galaxy that is has an, a passive elliptical galaxy behind it. That would be ideal. Um, however, lensing people, people who look for uh, uh, gravitational lenses, actually want the elliptical in front and want the emission lines further away. So funny enough, the first paper I did on this was literally somebody's reject. So if you're a, a student in the audience, and you uh, realize that somebody else's selection is actually your, re uh, your reject file, well, there's your collaboration uh, right there. So I've been doing that for a while. Um, but the best part, the best way to do this is just find, just find a whole bunch of people and ask them. And that's exactly what Bill Keel did with the Galaxy Zoo. So Galaxy Zoo volunteers are amazing and they're fun. And uh, they have a chat group that was very active and still as active. And so people kept throwing these things Bill's way. Like, hey, I found another one. Hey, I found another one. He just sort of put out a general call saying like, hey, if you find one, I'd like to make my list of about, you know, a dozen, I think he had two dozen objects at that point. I'd like my list of two dozen objects. I'd like to double that. That was sort of the goal. Um, and so people kept finding them everywhere in every possible configuration, right? So you, you just get lucky which way uh, everything was turned. And they kept going and they kept coming. And now he has 2,000, well over 2,000 of them, because uh, they are still trickling in. But he uh, made the catalog in uh, 2013. Another way that I thought might be useful if you're looking for close pairs, if you're looking like um, looking for dense groups of galaxies, the gamma survey was especially targeted to identify groups of galaxies. So I'm like, okay, well, if you get a redshift that are nicely separated out, so not merging galaxies, quite the opposite. It looks like they're merging, but they have nothing to do with each other. If there's a good redshift separation, that's another way to find them. So that's what I'm looking for. So how do you find these? Well, visually identified pairs with Galaxy Zoo, spectroscopically identified pairs with Gamma, and spectroscopic catalog pairs if you have like a really good cat uh, group catalog. That's great. They're, they sort of probe different geometries. Galaxy Zoo, it has to be clearly overlapping for people to actually mark them that way. Spectroscopically identified, they have to have enough flux in their uh, line of sight. So they tend to be completely overlapping, so deep overlaps. And spectroscopic catalog pairs actually can be a little more separate. That's So you sort of get the full range of possibilities. But at the moment, the visually identified pairs are winning by a mile. It's typically only 0.05% of the survey. But considering the kind of surveys that we're now getting into, like millions and millions of galaxies with redshifts, where you know that that actually starts being a decent number of um, uh, galaxies. Why? Okay. So what do we get out of it? Again, line of sight attenuation, retinue. So um, first thing first, <clears throat> I thought, okay, I have all these galaxies. I want to get high resolution pictures of them. So I asked for an HST snapshot program. 
the starlight absorption reddening through a survey of multiple occulting galaxies. This is the acronym I am the most proud of. Uh, you'll find any professor saying that uh, I have done many things, but this is the thing that I'm proud of. This is one of those. I having to fit all these words into an actual sensible uh, acronym was, uh, was a good thing. So this has sort of been my, uh, um, the uh, star smog is sort of my, my nickname for the entire project. Um, so we did um, V-band, so uh, 606W uh, images. And instead of trying to convince the time allocation committee that I could do all these things with dust, I really just simplified it to I have a supernova prior that you can probably use. So we actually observed about 50 of these things. I'm still analyzing them. Um, and so uh, every possible configuration, every possible, so some really strange ones was like, we actually aimed for the top two. And then it turns out there was a little uh, small dwarf galaxy in front of it that actually is absorbing a lot. Uh, and the really the, the poster child has become this one, VV191, where you have a perfectly face-on spiral galaxy and an elliptical galaxy situated you know, perfectly to, to highlight all that dusty structure behind it. Now, this is a short Hubble picture. Um, this is what it looks like on Sloan. So it's really impossible for us, you know, you can sort of see like, well, there's a little bit of brown stuff that could be dust. Uh, it's really hard to identify this from the ground. So as soon as you resolve this, uh, the, the dusty structures out, you can actually identify oh, this is a this is a great overlap. But I would have never put money on this uh, beforehand. This is what it looks like with Hubble. So you can so it's, you immediately see all the the intricate dusty structure. The thing that I want to draw your attention to is that if you look at a spiral galaxy in gas in hydrogen H one twenty one centimeter. Um, hydrogen gas, atomic gas, you typically get a disk that's, you know, about as wide as this picture. Um, the dust seems to be going all the way out. So there is no pristine gas disk. I want to just get rid of that whole idea. There is no pristine gas disk. There's always a little bit of dust in there somewhere. Um, and in dark clumps, as we can see. So that was pretty neat. Um, but uh, the, uh, the James Webb uh, NIRCAM uh, uh, TTO team uh, was looking for a pretty picture. So they asked uh, Bill for like, hey, do you have any, any of those pretty overlaps for us? And the answer was, yes, yes, we do. Funny you should ask. Uh, so uh, the science part of this is that we want to get that attenuation law, right? So it's, uh, we have the green one. That's, that's the image that I showed but we want to get filters on either side to see how that changes with wavelength. And you can see the bumps again at the 2100 angstrom. At Hubble, the 225W, the blue filter here, is as blue as Hubble gets. I really, really, really wish that um, 40 years ago, just before Hubble got launched, we actually had a coating that was even better at reflecting UV, but you know, all those were invented since. So um, Hubble is really not that much more sensitive. So we really like some information from a UV capable mission uh, there, but you can also get go on long words and that's where the JWST near cam data sits. So the uh, 090, 150, 200, there's actually two more filters to go um, and you get this. And um, I know we've all seen Hubble pictures and uh, JWST pictures for the last year. But this is my happy place. Uh, and so I really had to share. This is um, VV191 in, in full glory. The blue is the Hubble uh, image. The uh, red and green are the near cam images. Now, the resolution wise, they match up pretty well. That's It's pretty much the same resolution. However, it's the sensitivity that gets me. So nearby galaxies, you could see this, the spiral galaxy, you could see the elliptical just fine. And now you see all the stuff around it, right? You see all the little galaxies behind it. You see that little arc um, in the elliptical? That's a lens. We had no idea it was there. We took a Hubble picture, it's a little dot there. Um, you can see the dust lanes go all the way out. It's beautifully backlit by that elliptical. So we can actually start studying dust uh, through about a third of that galaxy disk and because of the backlighting from that elliptical galaxy, which is so smooth. I had not thought an elliptical galaxy would be that 
that smooth. It is really perfect. Any uh, deviations from uh, the uh, from the light profile is due to background sources. So um, yeah, this allows us to start studying this. So sorry, I had to flip it around because this is what we do. So we have the data here, the left bottom corner, and then we make a model for the elliptical. That's the background galaxy. We make a model for the foreground galaxy, that's F. And then we look at the transmission, which is basically the data minus the foreground model divided by the background model. And then we have our transmission map and we can start looking at how, so black means nothing comes through, white means all the light came through just fine. And we can do that in all the filters that we have. Now, the bottom two filters are essentially Spitzer's IREC1 and IREC2. Um, galaxies are pretty transparent there. There's still a little bit left, but if you want to look at dust with JWST, you sort of best off if you look at the shortest wavelength. So 090, that's about I band, so it's right on the cusp of infrared and optical, and F150, that's one and a half micron. So yeah, but here's the thing, at one and a half micron, I can still pick out dust lanes. I can still pick out dark stuff. So uh, there's a lot to study here. Uh, I sort of tried to give you the color image on the left here. So we make transmission maps for everything. You can see that in UV 336W, it's tricky. Uh, so optical and near infrared images were the best to, to get that. Um, on the wish list now is a six meter telescope that does UV, please. Um, and so we can start mapping UV, uh, uh, sorry, uh, we can start mapping attenuation curves. So we take that opti uh, optical image, we divide it up into particular areas that we're interested in. So one, two, three, four, five. Um, and then we start looking at the transmission in one curve, in one filter versus the other. So we look at things like, these are the different regions. We look at the 606 versus the 090. So that's this Hubble with JWST looking at the, um, uh, the pixels in each of these as uh, how much transmission there is and then fit the typical curve to it. Or I can show you the uh, with UV information. So this is the one area, here it is, where we actually have some UV information and it's really, really flat. So that's, a, that's odd. And so this is something to look at closer. Um, this is done with a whole ensemble of, of pixels because we're still uh, figuring out uh, how to do uh, proper error propagation in here. But this is where the signal to noise is actually decent all the way out, uh, where we have enough UV from the background elliptical. That's, the, that's the, the only thing the elliptical isn't good at is uh, producing a lot of UV photons. So further work is to map the attenuation pixel by pixel. So we do the actual curve pixel by pixel. So we can get a, a amount of attenuation, but also reddening. So we map the reddening law throughout the, uh, the foreground spiral. Now, why am I so interested in the reddening law? The reddening law gives us the, the amount of the, the grain sizes. So if you look at, uh, you know, if you happen to live in a very polluted area, like say New Jersey, uh, and you look out over the uh, sunset, it's very red because there's lots of fine particle dust out in the sky. However, if you're looking at a sunset in Hawaii where there isn't that much um, uh, particles or like basically uh, uh, diesel engines blowing, then uh, you don't get as red as a sun sunset. So. It's the amount of reddening, if you have a lot, that means that if it's very reddened, that means there's lots of fine particle dust, which means it's been processed. But if I don't see a lot of, I just see a lot of extinction, I don't see a lot of reddening, that's sort of equivalent of like everything sort of glommed together into bigger and bigger grains. So it tells me about how much processing has happened, what the ISM is actually made of. Um, and not only that, we want to compare that attenuation curve to other things like the Balmer decrement. So we've been measuring uh, dust extinction in whole galaxies by saying, well, here's the H-alpha line, here's the H-beta line. We know they have a fixed ratio from first principles. Okay, that's great. But now measure the Balmer decrement in this galaxy and with an eye of view as far as BMUs is coming uh, and then say, okay, this is the attenuation I'm actually measuring. So what's the Balmer decrement to um, uh, reddening slope, what's the actual translation of that? Um, and then we can compare the attenuation maps to actual emission. So we can look at the finest dust grains, the PAH is the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which is why we acronym that. Um, 
And so we can look at that and say, where do we see those glow and where do we see dust uh, by, uh, from, the, uh, from the attenuation, from the, uh, from the inextinction? So that's a JWS default idea. So there's lots of ideas to do. So really we have dust going, going off. It fits really neatly on a muse cube. So uh, that's coming. We're very quite excited because we're getting all this stuff in one go. There's a high redshift galaxy, it's lens. We can get the dust, tons of stuff happening. All right, back to these guys. Remember that we have this little, little spiral galaxy with a pretty dust, beard of dust around it. Um, is that typical? Now, the trick is, as soon as you have, I not just want to have an overlapping galaxy, I want an overlapping galaxy where the foreground galaxy is a dwarf galaxy, you sort of narrow down your search area so much that you're left with very few targets. Even if you have all of galaxies, you're happily shoveling targets into your feed. Um, and so uh, Star Smog Light was born, which is really just looking at the smallest galaxies uh, in front of a nice big, galaxy of any kind, right? So if it was an uh, elliptical, fine. If it was a big spiral, that will work. That will do it too. And so we sort of got a short list of dwarf galaxies somewhat in front of a, of a galaxy of a brighter elliptical or spiral galaxy. Uh, and so we, there, that was a Hubble snapshot program again, like a, sorry, a Hubble geo program. And so we're, we're um, uh, we got the data and we now are going to look at uh, where the dust sits in some of these dwarf galaxies. And the answer seems to be, yeah, it's it's throughout, right? The whole uh, notion that a LMC kind of galaxy doesn't have dust in its outskirts or is pretty, I mean, it might be transparent, but there's dust throughout that thing, right? So that's, uh, that's where I wanted to get at. Um, weirdly, this had a nice elliptical. I was all excited. And as far as I can tell, the elliptical's in front. So the redshifts have sort of messed with us because I went out and got redshifts with a long slit spectroscopy. Because if you have this in Sloan, the big bright galaxy has a redshift. The small galaxy nearby does not. So if you want to figure out which one of them is in front, you have to go get a redshift for it. And even then, because it's moving uh, and everything moves, it might, uh, might actually be uh, in front, uh, despite the fact that it's. Uh, it has a higher redshift. So this is still pretty complex. Uh, it's very complex morphology, even without interaction. So we need a good uncertainty estimate. And that's quite a complicated because the assumption is that they're uh, rotationally symmetric, but I'm interested in small scales. And then that symmetry argument at some point breaks. So how do I quantify that? Uh, do I model the galaxy or just simply flip them? And so I'm building a Python module to analyze all these. So hopefully that will be available at the end of my, sort of throwing my hat over the wall here. That'll be available at the end of my uh, sabbatical. Um, and the idea is that if you have a complicated galaxy like this, you can download your, uh, this, this thing and help you analyze how you can, because you can see the dust sitting here, like there's definitely something happening around that galaxy. Uh, and so you can hopefully map that and get a transmission map uh, of that um, of that galaxy. So it's still more to come. This is me trying it out on all kinds of different things, including the star small galaxies. So I can give that a good uncertainty and say, like, make something that has a has an instruction manual to go with. All right. Why was I so interested in those attenuation laws? Here you can sort of summarize what we know. Either locally, we've looked at stars, and so we get a B star, and we get a further, more distant B star, and we compare the two spectra and say, ah, I see a little bit of attenuation in between. So this is the attenuation curve. Like, look at the numbers of stars involved. It's, you know, a couple of dozen. But very much line of sight things, right? So Milky Way, Magellanic Clouds, um, with Gaia, we're getting a lot more, but only to a degree, because usually you need high resolution spectra. And you need spectra, you know, going from the UV all the way into the near infrared, which is the heart of the biggest trick. Or at high redshift, so literally anywhere but the Magellanic Clouds or the Milky Way, we take the Balmer decrement. And so all these other curves uh, are literally derived from the fact that we know that these two points are have this particular ratio. So if they're both diminished, but this one's diminished a little, uh, sorry, the blue one's diminished a little more, 
then we know what the attenuation curve is. You're literally fitting a curve through two data points. Of course, you can do this for lots and lots of galaxies and average things out, and that's what's been happening. But that's the, that's the, that's the mythology that we've been relying on. And we're going to get colors, and we're going to get um, multi-wavelength data on loads of galaxies, millions upon millions of them at all the different redshifts. And so from LSST and from Euclid and Roman, we'll have all that photometry, and there is some sort of reddening happening in there. So it right, might be useful to know which one of these curves, especially if that blue component moves into your LSST filters, uh, is actually happening. Do all of them have a uh, 2100 angstrom bump? Is actually the Magellanic Cloud one more common, or is that is that just a weird galaxy? Uh, so really, we'd like UV information at the at the local level. Uh, and so I'm saying we should launch UVEX as soon as humanly possible. So we have um, high resolution uh, and deep uh, UV imaging. So we can actually start constraining that part as well. Because just to illustrate, this is that little overlapping galaxy pair. I have three colors on it, lots of data, lots of good Hubble deep data. Uh, and you, you can see that in the blue, you get more attenuation. These are transmission maps, so you get more attenuation in the in the in the blue, and then you go to the red, and it sort of fades out because yeah, there's less. It's easily transmittable. Like the the light gets through this galaxy more easily. Uh, so I have blue, green, and red, and I can compare you know green against red, green against blue, and that ratio is very close to the Milky Way. If I resolve out these different different clouds, it looks like the Milky Way attenuation curve, but that's in the optical, and I wouldn't be able to tell the SMC from the Milky Way curve unless I had a bluer option uh, there as well. Um, another thing that will happen is that if I sample too large an area, say um, half the disk, then the amount of light that's missing is dominated by the very dense regions, and the light that comes through gives me the color, and that's dominated by the stuff that isn't absorbed. So I, I think of that as like, um, uh, these are quite common, uh, these screens are quite common in, uh, in Islam for, um, for all kinds of mosques. And I think it's a very clever thing because like you cut down the amount of light that comes in, but it still allows a breeze to go through. Um, and so the color of the sky has not changed, but the amount of light that I can see from the sky has changed. So if this effect, uh, and um, uh, Bill calls it the Matryoshka effect, um, it's, uh, it means that we can have light disappear and not be reddened at all. So it becomes gray if we average over too large an area. So we need to actually have high resolution images. So observed so far, attenuation curves are distributed as the log normal. It goes up, it goes back down, it has a tail. Um, that's actually quite useful to know because that means I can model it as a log normal. So the amount of extinction I see in a galaxy disks there is a tail towards higher values, but everything is a log normal distribution. Um, the values for that log normal probably, well, we know we can see that, uh, depend on the mass of the galaxy and how far out of the disk you are. The extinction is gray if you average over large areas, but it returns to Milky Way curve when, the, when you actually start resolving um, molecular clouds, essentially. So if you're at 100 parsec resolution, you you know the, the, the reddening uh, laws, Calcetti reddening law or the Milky Way reddening law sort of returns and you can see that curve. Um, dust extends out way further than you typically think. So both the dwarf galaxies, Vivo and 199 is a, is a Milky Way equivalent. So it is all the way out in the outskirts. Um, so there is no such thing as a pristine H1 disk, so I said pristine gas disk. The difference in reddening uh, seems to be happening in dense and diffuse areas. So if you have a dense area, you have a much more Milky Way-like curve. And if you are in a diffuse area, it's different. Um, so that seems to hint at some processing. That could be from either UV photons breaking uh, dust, or it could be that uh, in denser clouds, you're like a glom more stuff to you. So maybe uh, but processing seems to be happening, and that's something to follow up on. Uh, during the interaction, the low AV, 
so this is something that we found in an actual one interacting pair. The diffuse dust was gone. Uh, I didn't show that, so I'll happily chat about that later. But that's that's another thing that we found is like the low uh, column density dust. That's the first thing to clear out. It's just the dense dark stuff hangs around longer. Uh, and so an appropriate dust prior, uh, I've been playing with that. It helps with the H0 controversy. Um, so it actually diminishes the issue a little bit, but it's not enough. So um, we don't actually get, it doesn't go away, right? The Hubble constant controversy, the what four and a half sigma or however we are right now, um, <clears throat> Uh, between cosmological microwave background and the uh, supernova distances, I can't move the supernova distances all the way over where the cosmo uh, cosmological microwave background uh, was uh, H0 values are. So that's still not a res it's not it's not a panacea. It's not something that will uh, completely solve that, but it does help. It goes in the right direction. Okay, so that's what we've had. Um, this was my. Look, you and I was very nervous, so I talked a little too fast. I'm very sorry, but that means that I have some time for questions, which was what I was hoping to go for. So what can you call do for you? I can give you a value of sort of probability distribution, like you can you hit this much extinction, you see this much dust in your line of sight into a galaxy uh, other than our Milky Way. Um, and if you have enough information, we can say, and it reddens like this. If it's um, if it's in, if you're in the ultraviolet, it reddens like this. If you're in the um, optical, uh, and you want to know like you want to know how your object is going to look like uh, at longer wavelengths, this is the reddening curve that you're likely to use. And the last thing is sort of for everybody who's designing a survey or anything. Uh, don't forget about Oscar. Oscar is the Oscar de Grinch is the uh, Muppet that I use for this. Uh, is the Muppet that it lives in the trash can. Uh, your selection discard can somebody be somebody else's sample because you had very strict rules for why you didn't want those ga uh, galaxies, which means that you now have a very cleanly selected sample that somebody else can use. And honestly, I can be that somebody else. So that's that one takeaway that I want to give to every student. Keep your not selected sample because you can make somebody else's day with that. So uh, with that, um, hit me up over Gmail or Twitter or what have you, and I'll take questions. Thank you, speaker. We'll uh, start with questions in the auditorium, but in the meantime, on Zoom, if you could raise your hands, that'd be great. All right, let's start with, uh, does anybody in the auditorium have any questions? Jesus, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ben, for the talk. Uh, I don't know if I missed it. So do you need the galaxies to be distance, but especially one on top of the other one? Or they, they can also be interactive galaxies? So I prefer not interacting galaxies uh, because the first thing that will happen is that the tidal force is the symmetry argument sort of goes away. Um, we've uh, have analyzed some interacting pairs uh, where they looked pretty symmetric, but that's um, that's very subjective, which is why I prefer a a good redshift gap between both galaxies. So I'd wow. like to have a redshift for both of them, and I'd like them to be you know six hundred kilometers per second apart, which I think translates to. So that you yeah. not only selected them by the gal galaxy zoo, but you also have spectra. Yeah, so this is the follow-up that we've been looking at um, to get spectra from the galaxy zoo. So um, ah, here we go. There's Oscar. Um, sorry for the fast <laughs> flipping. If I go back to the galaxy zoo ones, Um, the way Sloan is organized is that it will assign one fiber to the bright thing there. And so typically uh, one of these galaxies will have a uh, redshift and the other one won't. So you have to either go back and get, put a slit on something or hope that uh, there's enough um, flux from both galaxies in the fiber to actually get a second redshift. This is proven tricky, but possible. 
Um, so uh, we've been uh, we've been trying to get secondary redshifts. That's actually the been the big holdup to make sure that we've got a second redshift for the for the background or foreground galaxy. So if it's a small galaxy and it's in the foreground, it's not going to get a fiber assigned. So uh, I don't have redshift often for it. Thanks. Thanks, Jesus. Uh, do we have another question in the auditorium? Okay, uh, Rosa, you have a question. Hello, Rosa. Do you have a question? Sorry, sorry, I didn't have my mic on. Sorry, that, that's very very nice, awesome sample. Um, can you go back to your poster child picture, Benny? Please. Uh, I have so many poster childs. No, no, but it was the, the one where you have a very nice elliptical and, um, ah, and the fire. Yeah. That one. Yeah, so the, the, the. So I animated a bunch of things. So. This is probably easier. Um, lost patience. That Here one. we go. Yes, so this is the, uh, the Hubble and. and in the web working together picture, so. Okay, so of course you can see the background galaxies better behind the, the elliptical than behind the spiral, right? <laughs> so you have yes, it's... background galaxies and it's much easier always to see them behind the elliptical than behind the spiral and they are quite red. So is that dust in the spiral? Is that dust in the elliptical or is just are they red shifted? Do, do they belong to a group? So they're all like all these all these little galaxies are most of them are red shifted. They're red shift uh, for anywhere from one to four. Um, <clears throat> so for example, that arc is at red shift uh, three and a half. I did say that James Webb is a monster, and uh, a short exposure will get you very very deep. It is also all long wavelengths. So um, the reason that they're red is because they're there is like you don't see them in the blue in this in this picture because the blue is the Hubble short exposure. Um, and so they're red for that reason, and they're because they're high redshift. And um, we've sort of noticed that with the Hubble deep, sorry, the James Webb deep pictures that they're if you would have automatically turned that into an RGB color, um, which again, they're all in the near infrared. Uh, you sort of get the same color for everything. So if you look at a nearby cluster, every galaxy is sort of yellow, uh, except for the really distant ones, which are red. So there's sort of two reasons why everything is red here. Uh, they're super bright in the near camp images and you just don't see them with Hubble. I would have had to integrate like way longer. Um, it really makes a big difference, uh, two and a half versus six and a half meters in diameter. Uh, and, you know, 40 years of uh, improved optics, definitely this popped out immediately. All those little things you don't see in the Hubble picture for that reason. So that's why that's so red. Okay, so it's absolutely useless uh, to try to, to de derive a, an extension from them. They have not- I would- um, I would not do that. So you can sort of see this uh, this this galaxy, this um, look like an S zero ish kind of thing. Um, in uh, at the bottom here, um, the reason for that it becomes problematic is that the foreground galaxy, the ellipse, the spiral here has so much structure in it. So you start resolving both the um, the dense regions and the diffuse regions, and so you you can get reddening. Uh, in a few pixels, that's true, but you'd have to know intrinsically what kind of color you're looking at anyway. Um, I don't know, it might be possible if you put a JWST spectrum on one of these things. I talked at length about this with um, Adam Reese of all people, because he was very interested of getting near uh, JWST attenuation curves in the galaxies that he's getting uh, supernova and Cepheids. And so it would be nice to have uh, an indication of what the reddening law would be 
trouble is that I can derive the reddening law in between two spiral alarms here and go, oh yeah, it's Milky Way, it's fine. And then my supernova goes off in one of these dark structures because that's also where the star formation is happening. And it's different. It varies a lot. Um, or it definitely varies from place to place in one of these spirals. So it would be very interesting to see what kind of reddening law we get and then translate that to, um, to into supernova uh, prescriptions, so to speak. But it's because you will have so many background galaxies. Uh, yeah, I'm not counting them again. Start to throw them out. So uh, this is something that uh, all my collaborators have figured out. It uh, makes me twitch just a little bit if they go like, oh, you could count background galaxies. It's like, yes, yes, you could. Um, so another thing that I've noticed is with the MIPS, sorry, not MIPS, uh, MIRI uh, images, the EH colors for a nearby galaxy are such that a background galaxy stands out in the cluster, in the cluster searches. Uh, and I immediately have the same thing, like, oh, we could count this. Um, Yes, but no. Um, I don't think we have the numbers for counting in a galaxy like this, even if you go to like the Fangs galaxies, which is where those Miri uh, pictures are for, uh, or ballpark numbers are similar to your 1998 paper and my PhD. Uh, your numbers don't improve that much. You could just see the dust in between these galaxies better. Um, I think the ultimate uh, count for that was the Andromeda project, uh, where they got uh, 2,500 uh, background galaxies identified in the uh, in the HST, you know, giant mosaic, which is as many as I did for my entire PhD um, in three weeks, which is a bit like, oh, you did three and a half, you did my, what was that? That was about two years of my life in three weeks. Cool. Um, so. But that didn't get any better resolution than, say, the uh, the Herschel image. So I'm not sure there's much information in uh, counting background galaxies but anymore. All the background galaxies in all your sample. So yeah, that's. I mean, I counted about, including the artificial ones, about three thousand, and they found twenty five hundred in Andromeda alone in three weeks' time. It's the power of the crowd. If you crowdsource with citizen science just on it, you know, several thousand people are looking at it, they're going to find them, they're going to circle them, and there you go. They were looking for stellar clusters, but it's a neat little uh, uh, paper that I still mean to write up someday, but uh, it, was, it was kind of impressive. So yes, you could possibly use these background galaxies, but I'm not sure what it actually tell you again, what the um, what an overlap wouldn't in quite a bit of better detail. Okay, thank you, Benny. Okay. Do we have any more questions on Zoom or in the auditorium? Uh, yes, that is great. <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, you have a foreground uh, galaxy, and uh, I'm wondering how do you take into account the diffuse starlight of that galaxy in the foreground in your calculation. Right, so. Um, I'll just go to my original one here. Um, so I don't make a distinction between spiral alarms and the foreground disk. So I know that there is a light profile. Our, our eyes work in the way that um, <clears throat> if there's enough contrast, so there's enough contrast with the spiral alarms, even if there's a bright elliptical behind it, but I actually work with the pixel by pixel. So on the far side, there is a pixel that is corresponding to the pixel that I'm looking at, uh, and it has light in it. So I subtract that first. At some point, that doesn't really become important because the, the further out from the foreground galaxy I go, the less the, um, the light transmission is and the more background galaxy I have. So at some point, it really doesn't matter if I subtract it anymore. But I do take the diffuse light into account because otherwise you're going to see a big diffuse um, uh, absorbing component that's just simply not there. 
uh, this is the neat thing about this, this methodology, uh, method. I can measure zero if there is no extinction and these things are for, far enough apart, I can say that with a certain level, level of uh, accuracy, like I know that there is no extinction because of the symmetry of the background object. So I can measure zero, which is very helpful. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I see a very small picture of the room, so I'm... Uh, Okay, thanks, Ricardo. Yeah, yeah, I only have a question about maybe something that I missed or I misunderstood. At some point, you mentioned that the stellar mass of the galaxy is important to understand. I think the problem, the, well, not understand, but is at some way correlated with the probability of the um, extinction, uh, essentially the extinction, or the extinction probability curve, essentially. Or yeah, so, so that's um, that's sort of something we built off um, this very few galaxies so far. So we've got uh, here we've got a big spiral in front of a, another spiral. So it's really hard to distinguish the two. Um, both of those are sort of ten to the ten. Here, the foreground galaxy is ten to the nine. Um, the VV one nine one is ten to the ten and a half. So it started to look like if we see the distribution of extinction values that that tail is there if it's big enough, if the galaxy is simply massive enough. Uh, and uh, it's, there's still a distribution, there's still a little bit of a tail, but it, it sort of the tail disappears as you get to smaller and smaller galaxies. This is intuition built on a few objects. So what we really would like to do is, is quantify that other than you know more means bigger tail that's still a little too hand wavy for me i want to see say like here's um you're this far into or outside the petrosian radius uh it's a 10 to the 10 solar mass galaxy uh stellar mass uh this is your you know these are the parameters for the log normal distribution for extinction values that you can uh, uh, expect that's the ultimate goal does that answer the question yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hey. Uh, does anybody else have a question? Uh, I have a quick question, uh, Benny. Yeah. Uh, I was curious. Uh, so, um, what fraction of your sample is elliptical plus spiral rather than spiral on spiral? And uh, is one of them easier to model than the other? The elliptical is so much easier to model. If you have a background uh, spiral, this is good if you want to do UV measurements. Uh, but you can see here that um, the uncertainty from the background galaxy is, you know, if spirals introduce, spiral arms introduce substructure, and if the background galaxy also has spirals, you just sort of introduce uh, uncertainty on top of uncertainty. Uh, here, I would like to note, by the way, that all the little dots that you see are a third galaxy called NGC 253, and we're all the way out. Um, and this is why Hubble was looking that it was looking for the stellar population. So we're sort of seeing this through a screen of stars. And then you've got these two, and then you've got a couple of red galaxies that are way in the distance. So, um, you know, you sort of always get everything smacked together. Um, we get, we have something like 300 galaxies where the background galaxy is an elliptical and, you know, a well behaved elliptical. We've got about 180 that's an elliptical plus an elliptical. So you can actually measure the uh, dust in the foreground or elliptical galaxy. Um, the trick there has been to just simply you know, model everything. Um, so we're sort of manpower. We went from sample limited to manpower limited. I unfortunately have a grad student, Clayton Robinson, working on this now. So uh, hopefully we can speed this up. Um, and then the vast majority is two spirals. So actually pretty, pretty tricky. So if you can automate the uncertainty uh, effort that, or uh, estimate, that would be really helpful, uh, especially since the background galaxy sort of drives the uncertainty. Asymmetry in the background drives the uncertainty. Okay, thanks. That seems like a lot of work still to be done. Um, yeah. Good luck. <laughs> okay, yes, it's, we, it's yeah, always a work in progress. Yeah, we have time for one question, if anyone has one. Okay. If not, let's thank Ben again. Thanks, Ben. Thank you for having me.
I know you have to, so you have to probably rush to enter the flow. Uh, I do have to, uh, I was trying to put my, here we go. Ah, yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, um, thanks very much. So uh, I will send you an email about the uh, uh, permissions for you know, getting a copy of your presentation. <laughs> okay, no problem. All right, copy that. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.